Hey, again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you find yourself um, clicking this YouTube button. Hope your day is going well. Um, it is Friday, so it's going to be the weekend here, and um, at least we can be thankful for, for that coming to the end of a week here. Um, so I want to continue this conversation on our Zoom meeting. We had a discussion about the, the fall of man. On Tuesday, you had a reading about that, and I kind of wanted to just circle back to a few ideas and, um, and concepts and kind of explore a little bit more of, of that in a nuanced approach in this conversation. So um, anthropology, we, we discussed it the, the, la the last week specifically, and there were a, there were a couple of good answers to the question. Um, why was mankind created? What's the purpose of mankind? And a, a few of you in the notes that you produced and answered that question as I asked, thank you. Um, you, you, you came to the right conclusion there. Um, it specifically says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. And the purpose of mankind, or why is mankind here? Why is mankind created? Is to specifically reflect God. That is, that's ultimately why we're here. Um, as as human beings okay and and so that's kind of the starting point for this we're going to transition a little bit here in this lecture from anthropology that idea to then what happened why are we here why do we live in a world with hurt and pain and brokenness from waking up in the morning as you get older and man i tell you what the third the, the mid 30s they, they'll get you um but you wake up with weird pains in your in your knees and your lower back and your shoulders, all all sorts of things. And it's crazy. Um, to those kind of silly things to to more serious problems like disruption in the family or broken nations and relationships and um, and all of that. Um, why do we live in that kind of world? So that's where we're headed with this conversation as it relates to um, homartiology. But just so we have the good context and foundation for this. Um, it, so image and likeness, what, what does that specifically mean? What does it mean to be created in God's image? There are books written about this. So one PowerPoint slide, it's not going to cut it. I guarantee you that. Um, so explained as um, his having dominion specifically his, mankind, mankind's dominion over God's creation as vice regent. And we are, we are called ultimately to, to reflect God's goodness. So when he created the world, each day he said, this is good. And, and so his very re creation was a reflection of that goodness, of who he was. There was a fall. Um, but even before the fall, and this is what I want to point out, we were called to have dominion over that which God created. It, it was our job. It was our um, responsibility to to care for what God had created and I still think some of that's there today and um, some of you mentioned in conversation um, about that world that you would want to see last week and I just I thought there were so many beautiful heartfelt responses to that qu uh, question what kind of world would you want if you were the creator and so many of you so many of you have these beautiful hearts that just want to see all the bad stuff go away. Even, you know, some of you were saying, I, I wish all the plastics that are harming our world would just go away. I wish the the environment could be restored and healed. I was just, uh, I was watching this um, video of a beautiful jellyfish yesterday on the news. Um, a reporter over in Venice was saying um, that water city there that they're actually in the canals able to see the jellyfish and and the uh, the um, aquatic life that it was not as visible when so many boats were going through there and um, and some people are saying well it's just that probably because there's no sediment being kicked up but um, I, I do think that this whole pause button on our world has given the the world a chance to just breathe, maybe even reset and get back to what was normal for it. Um, and, and I think we should be a part of that too. Um, 
I'm so thankful I live in a state that cares about recycling. And we actually have a recycling bin and those products and those go and they're recycled. Whereas when I travel down to like California or um, Arizona specifically, my family down there was there a couple of years ago and they just have one big bin. I'm like, wait, where, where does the cardboard or plastic go? And they're like, what? And so I'm thankful that Oregonians care about that kind of stuff. It's good. Um, and so image and likeness, God's image does not consist in man's body. So don't, don't get confused with that. There's more on that later. Some people think, well, if this is the image of man, head, shoulders, knees, and toes, God must have the same image there, head, shoulders, knees, and toes. And We'll talk a little bit more about that later next year in Mormonism. Mormons actually believe that to be true. They think the Father, Elohim, God in the Old Testament has a body just like you and me. All sorts of problems with that, but not enough time to discuss that right now. Um, but, But we are in his image and likeness specifically as it relates to spiritual, intellectual, moral likeness to to God from whom his um, animating breath came. So we see that animating breath lived out, especially at the end of John's gospel when Jesus breathes quite literally on his disciples and they receive the Holy Spirit. And in the New Testament, we see what kind of person results from God breathing or the spirit, the wind of God coming into someone's life. Uh, we begin to take on the mind of Christ. We begin to live out our life just as Jesus did. Okay, so there is that animating breath that comes from God. And I encourage you to sit and wait for that on a daily basis and say, God, I need that animating breath from you. I need you to fill me. This whole last week, I've been asking myself every morning or reminding myself, part of me, Apart from you, Christ, I can do nothing. I need you to fill me up. I need to um, be filled up by the God of the universe. And he has that ability to do that with us. And then from there, we're able to respond to our situations. And I'll be the first to stand in line. I don't always respond to situations the best possible way. It's been hard to do these teachings, as I'm sure it's been hard to do learnings on your end. In between teaching, sometimes I have to go out into the room and say, hey, guys, be quiet and Um, just as I did a second ago here. And sometimes I don't always reflect God's uh, goodness and and his love, even to those who are closest to me, like my family members. It's crazy. But thankfully, we have God's forgiveness and whatnot um, along in that process. And we can be centered again in his love. So what does this mean? Ultimately, it distinguishes us from the animal kingdom. Being made in God's image and likeness is not something that happened to the animals, all right? And, and we have a lot of um, other places in the Old and New Testament that reflect on this. We are God's representative on earth. Um, Psalm 8 is a, a wonderful chapter. Man is made a little lower than the angels or those um, angelic beings. Uh, but still, man is crowned with glory and, and made to rule over the works of God's hand. So Psalm 8 is simply a worshipful response of the psalmist who simply finished reading Genesis 1 and 2. Um, and what the beautiful thing here is it's not just for a king. Okay, back in the day, um, let's just use Pharaoh as an example. Pharaoh believed, as well as all the Egyptians during that time, and maybe you learned this in uh, last year's Old Testament class, Pharaoh believed that he was the very image of God. And it was only Pharaoh that was the image of God, no one else. What the psalmist does here is recognizing that God has put every single person on the same level as being able to reflect his goodness, his image. You don't just have to be a king. You don't just have to be a male that's a king. You don't just have to be a male or some you know patriarchal idea of that you're a you could be a man or a woman uh, a boy or a girl and you have the ability to reflect god's goodness into your world because that's how god made you and god shares that with absolutely every single person out there which is awesome being made in his image is also um, the ability to simply relate to god um Humankind is appointed to rule and to multiply as well. So that brings us to, okay, so that sounds really, really, really good. All that image and likeness stuff. And it is, it's amazing. 
But Genesis chapter three hit, and there were there was um, a, a big halt in that process of mankind ruling and 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 being able to have dominion over the creation. And again, you learned this last year in your Bible class. But again, this is um, homarchiology and now. Um, or anthropology, and now homarchiology here in theology class. What church fathers have called Genesis chapter 3, or the humans in Genesis chapter 3 moving forward, is damaged goods. Recognizing everything I just said about being made in his image and likeness, and God says that's very good. Like it's, he was, he was so happy. I could, I can't help but think of a creator God who's smiling at his creation, just loving it. Um, but then as church fathers recognize Genesis chapter three, put a halt in that. And as a result, we are damaged goods. And so all the way throughout the old Testament, there's kind of this desire to get back to the garden. And, you know, you can think of Israel living in the land and they're not you know doing well as israel often rebelled and disobeyed god and, and went against his his ways and everything they, they weren't doing well and so god would have to as you learned last year bring prophets into their world and into their lives and say return to god repent stop going after the gods of this world follow god's word and not the ways of the world and so you had all these prophets coming and saying those things Sometimes those prophets would give pictures of a time in the future that was going to reflect or resemble the time in the past in the garden. Okay, so you're you have a des, you have a desire of the prophets to see this even take place in the world in which they live now. And so Isaiah eleven six would say, "Man, there's going to be this time when the wolf will live with a lamb. No more lamb chops. The leopard will lie down with the goat." the calf and the lion and the yearling together and a little child will lead them. And so it, it, it's, it's the beautiful picture here of a, a kid just spending time with all of these creatures where there's peace, there's harmony. There is ultimately from Isaiah's perspective, restoration. A world that is broken is going to be put back together again, okay? So in other words, that was kind of the super serious emotional response to this. And the funny thing is we're all Humpty Dumpties and we all need to be put back together the right way. This happens only with the resurrection. Now, I usually ask a question during this time, and it's just maybe now reduced to you think about it right where you're at. In, in the Gospels, in John's Gospel specifically, Jesus is shown not holding a shovel, but this artist had some privilege, some artistic theological privilege to put a shovel in Jesus' hands. As this worshiper of Jesus, Mary comes and bows down, finally realizing who this person was. Because before, before this worshiper of Jesus at the end of John's gospel looked and said, you're the gardener, you tell me where they have put the body of Jesus. She's looking right at Jesus and saying this, but she mistook Jesus. Don't, don't miss this. She mistook Jesus for being the gardener. Now, this is John's clever way. Uh, as he often does, he alludes back to the Old Testament. Who was the gardener in Genesis chapter 1 and 2? Maybe you've thought about it now. God was the gardener. He was the one piecing everything together. He was creating and building and, cre and and putting mankind in this perfect garden and for them to rule and reign and multiply and all of that. And now only through the resurrection is something like this going to take place. And this is why the worshiper early on mistook Jesus for being a gardener. She was looking for Jesus, but found this gardener. What a beautiful thing. And here in this picture, this is one reason why I love art and all the art students here listening to this, maybe you'll appreciate this. There's little little um, um, saplings coming up from this stump that's cut down because Jesus in John chapter 15 talks about this at length, that he is 
his father is the vine dresser, Jesus is the vine, and there are branches coming out of Jesus, and every branch that doesn't bear fruit is going to be cut off and thrown away, and every branch that doesn't bear fruit is going to be pruned so that it does bear fruit. And so here this artist is saying, God, 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 God had to get rid of this whole tree because this whole system of Israel was not working and they were pushing people away from the presence of God and not inviting people into the presence of God. But as a good gardener recognizes, there's always going to be new life coming out as a result of that. And this picture, because of scripture, reminds me Jesus is that gardener. He is creating a new world uh, for his followers and, uh, to rule and, and to have dominion and to reign and to multiply by creating disciples and being very creative in the world in which they exist. Man, thank God for the resurrection. Okay, I'm getting awful preachy on you. I'm sorry. Okay, so here it is. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was, again, the gardener. Here's a scripture reference. She said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And, and so, again, that was just uh, John's way of saying Jesus is the garden, the resurrection through this. There's going to be new life and he's doing something new. What we have to recognize now going back into this, um, but there was a fall, right? There was a fall. And David in Psalm 51 recognizes this. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And in sin, my mother conceived me. This is the one place in the Old Testament, at least, that we see this passage uh, or, or this teaching of original sin very clear. David says, even in my mother's root womb, and not just there at some point, he says, right when I was conceived. And that's a Hebrew way of saying, obviously, conceived, the English word it puts in your mind the seed and um, the sperm, the egg and the sperm coming together. That's the, per, that's the moment of conception. So David's saying, even at that point, I was um, in sin because he's recognizing as a worshiper before God, I live in a broken world and I can't get away from it. Um, and this is something that the book of Romans, Paul the Apostle would pick up on and say, through one man, sin entered the world, death spread through all mankind. And so his um, theological, or pardon me, his practical reason for why all mankind sin is because all mankind die. Um, and if, if there's anybody that's ever not died, um, that would kind of disrupt Paul's whole teaching there. Um, so all that to say, um, all of us were, this is the concept of original sin, kind of born into a broken world. Now, some people have problems with that and say, well, telling me that that little baby there is a sinner. If that little baby is there as a sinner, they're going to go to hell, blah, blah, blah. We can talk about that perhaps at another Zoom call. But no, I don't, I don't think we should push theology upon people in a negative way in that sense. All this is communicating is mankind is born into a broken world. We are sinners before a righteous God. And that's why we, at some point in our life, need to turn to him in repentance. That's the big idea. So Paul would also say in Ephesians 2, 3, among them... Paul says, we, he's including himself in that conversation, we too all formally lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and emit and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So Paul is recognizing outside of the life of Christ, we are all children of wrath, okay? It was good in the garden. There was disruption in the relationship between mankind. We were no longer closely connected to God as we were once upon a time. We became children of wrath because we chose sin rather than choosing God. And because of that, Paul says, we're all children of wrath, all of mankind. And Paul would say in another um, book and a well-quoted pas uh, passage of scripture, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So it says, therefore, just as through one man, I just quoted this a second ago, sin entered the world. It was through Adam's sin entered the world and death through sin. So, uh, so, and so spread to all mankind because all sinned. So we all sinned. Death is spread to all of us. We all die 10 out of 10, no matter what, no matter how good of a life you live, no matter how good of food you put in yourself, no, how many, no, no matter how many cigarettes or alcohol or drugs you avoid, you're going to die at the end of your life. We're all going to die. We're all subject to death. And that's Paul's major point of, Hey, we're all sinners. We're all going to come to the end of ourselves at some point. Um, hopefully we can come to the end of ourselves in this life and repentance and turn towards God.
So there's a lot of biblical descriptions. I'm not going to read through all of these uh, other than to highlight the ones that are underlined. Um, lawlessness. We break God's laws. If you don't believe me, read the Ten Commandments, read moral passages in the New Testament. We break God's laws all the time. Um, whether that's like actually f really physically committing some um, horrible sin like murder to maybe another socially acceptable sin like, well, I just slept with my boyfriend or girlfriend, no big deal, to maybe even more of a so socially acceptable sin like, well, I'm just watching soft porn on Netflix, no big there deal there, to maybe not so much a socially acceptable sin like, well, I am watching pornography. All of the gamut, whatever it might be, we break God's law. We have greed in our heart. We want more. I don't like that person. I have really negative thoughts towards them. And man, I just can't stand them. Well, that's committing murder in your own heart, Jesus says, towards that person or lustful thoughts of adultery, actually committing those. So we break God's law all the time. There's wrongdoing that we do. And wrongdoing just means unrighteousness, unrighteous things that we do. Um, we know the right thing to do, but we don't always do it. And to us, that sin is what James says. And there's a lack, ultimately, of a conformity to God's character. I know what God wants me to do, but I choose not to do it. That's rebellion. That's sin. And ultimately, that is called missing the mark. Okay, so there's a, there's a video that I want um, to show you here. Um, and this is what I mean when I say missing the mark. I think this contrasts it rather well. Check it out. You can't always plan when you'll need a gun. Yeah, Rational gun owners carry not because it's a weapon, but because it's a shield. The Centuries ago, master archers were able to perform incredible feats of archery. These skills have long since been forgotten, but the Danish archer Lars Anderson is trying to reinvent what has been lost. He uses forgotten historical methods and holds all his arrows in the same hand as shoots with. Once, this technique was widespread, and the Syrian artwork shows that the method is at least 5,000 years old. Arab archery, the most extensive historical book ever made about archery states, this is the best type of shooting, and there's nothing beyond it in power or accuracy. Using this technique, Lars has set several speed shooting records and shoots more than twice as fast as his closest competitors. And being able to shoot fast is just one of the benefits of the method. But the big question is, why has it been forgotten today? About 10 years ago, Lars started using a bow. The arrows, he carried in a quiver on his back. Surprisingly, the quiver turned out to be useless when it came to moving fast. The back quiver is a Hollywood myth and was not common in the past, but it is still spread all over the world. Why? Because modern archers do not move. They stand still, firing at a target board, something that was unknown in the past. These archers also started placing the arrow on the left side of the bow, just as archers do in movies. This is probably due to the fact that aiming at a stationary two-dimensional target makes you aim with one eye instead of two. This one-eyed aiming also led to bows with front sights and other technical gadgets, but that's another story. However, placing the arrow left around the bow is not good while you're in motion. By placing the arrow on the left side... I'm going to pause it and, and kind of uh, get to the end here because he does uh, something pretty crazy. Um, but you can tell he's just a good archer here, and that's kind of the point that I'm going to make in this. Who can escape ten arrows fired quickly after another? From old texts, we know that Saracen archers were expected to be able to fire three arrows in 1.5 seconds, and very skilled archers were even faster. Lars has managed to shoot three arrows in 0 0.6 seconds, but while speed is important, hitting the target is essential. To test accuracy and speed at the same time, Lars set up an experiment where he shot incoming arrows with arrows of his own. But he took it one step further. In the 1938 movie, The Adventures of Robin Hood, Robin Hood splits an arrow down the middle. Some consider this the ultimate archery trick. They're wrong. The ultimate archery trick is splitting an incoming arrow in two with one of your own. We do not recommend you trying this at home. And yes, I also don't recommend you trying that at home. Um, but the point of this is here you have someone, Lars Anderson, who has dedicated a certain portion of his life to please YouTubers out there. Um, and he shows us how, how much energy and effort it actually takes to hit the target. Um, I don't think there's anything different in our Christian life. And that's why one idea or one meaning of the word sin, as I mentioned before, is to hit the target. 
And so I think this is a, a beautiful, thank you, Lars um, Anderson, for doing that, because it's a beautiful a picture for me that I, I, I got to put effort and um, a, a dilig and diligence and in, in time and, and energy into my devotion to Christ, okay, so that I can hit the target, because when I don't hit the target of who God is or who God wants me to be, then I fall in one of these categories here of lawlessness, wrongdoing, not doing what I know what is the right thing to do, which ultimately is a lack of conformity to God's character. Okay, so ultimately sin is this. Therefore, sin is anything in the creation which does not express or which is contrary to the holy character of the creator. And that takes time to figure out, all right? It, it takes devotion to read in the scripture, who is God? Who, and, and we study that in theology proper, his attributes, his characteristic, and his traits. Anything apart from that is, is a departure from that which is ultimately good, um, both from God's point of view and from mine, okay? And ultimately for my life specifically. But where does sin come from? All right. So there's this big question like, all right, where where is it then? And where did it originate? Why is it even here? What's the purpose of it? Um, so the tree is, is a means to test whether man will obey God or not. We see that in the garden. Um, thus, the knowledge of God and evil is something God would teach man. Ultimately, I, uh, theologians and church fathers and church history and even um, Jewish um, teachers of this would, would think somehow, some way, God was going to ultimately teach them about the knowledge of good and evil somehow. There, there has to be obedience in that as well. And that's, that's why specifically the tree was there. But in the process um, of choosing whether to trust God's word or not, how did they do, you know, the act of actually eating the tree? And so some theologians, specifically this fellow here, Gustin, I'll read his quote in a second, piece together for us what the different stages of mankind looks like, All right? And so some of this is pretty redundant and you're thinking, well, yeah, that looks pretty redundant to me. But what they're trying to do ultimately, and if we were in class, I would have you do the same thing first, but we're not in class. So I'm just gonna tell you um, Augustine's idea here. So you have a pre-fall man, before Genesis chapter three, you have the post-fall man, obviously after Genesis chapter three, up until our present time, whoever is not a Christian during this time. And then you have the reborn man, those who are in Christ, and then you have a glorified man. So Augustine and other church fathers, I always say Augustine or Augustine, I interchange his name. Um, I've heard it so many different, uh, two different ways, so I always say it two different ways. But anyway, four different stages. You might think, okay, maybe there's a fifth or a sixth or whatever, and you can write that out, and maybe uh, you know, 1,500 years people will be quoting you. That's cool. But we're going to use Augustine here um, just for simplicity. So pre-fall man, mankind, they were able to sin. Obviously, we see that Genesis chapter 3, they had the capacity to sin. They chose sin. That's what they wanted. Um, but then also, they had the capacity not to sin. In Genesis, Eve could have looked at the serpent and been like, no, I'm not going to do that. God said not to, so I'm going to obey that. Um, and so in pre-fall man, able to sin, able not to sin. Post-fall man, this is a strong argument, but a lot of theologians throughout church history have believed this to be true, that mankind is only able to sin and unable to not sin. Now that unable to not sin, your English mind might be thinking, well, negatives cancel each other out, and aren't you basically saying the same thing, able to sin? Well, yes, but it's a stronger way of saying um, able to sin because it puts it in the negative rather than the positive. So positively, you're only able to sin. And in the very negative sense, unable to not sin. And in the original, um, I don't know Latin. Maybe some of you have taken Latin classes, but I know Greek. And sometimes a double negative in Greek um, is like an exclamation mark. And so too in other uh, uh, languages, um, especially Greek and Latin. And so he's thinking in those terms like, and especially unable to not sin. So it's kind of like a heightened sense of the, of the same idea they're able to sin. As a reborn man, what happens to mankind is we go back to an ability uh, of what we saw in the garden there. So we're able to sin and able to not sin once again. We can actually do something that is good and pleasing to God 
in a way that is also going to be reflective of his image to those around us, uh, what we call our neighbors. And then you have a glorified man over here. And, and some people say, well, if I still have free will in heaven, doesn't that mean I'm going to sin in heaven also? And I'm going to have a chance to be separated from God. And the whole story, Genesis chapter three is going to happen. And I'm going to be the one that's at fault. We can get kind of stressed out about that when we think about heaven. But the way that church fathers say this is I do this by way of, uh, of holding your breath activity. Because in heaven, a glorified person, you're able to not sin and unable to sin. You're only ever able to please God in heaven in our glorified bodies. One, because we're going to receive a new body in heaven. And so that new body is going to be um, fixed with a, comp a perfectly restored soul. And we are going to only ever respond in goodness to God and in goodness to each other. Now, the way that I um, say that is your body right now is designed to always take a breath, okay? So unless you were like one of my friends back in a couple of years ago, they shared this story that they used to hold, and there's a small percentage of people I found out, that they can hold their breath and they do so out of rebellion so that they can pass out and avoid whatever consequence or situation is about to happen. Usually toddlers do that, but it's a really small percentage of toddlers. That's kind of a funny thing. Um, I guess not so funny, but as my friend was explaining it, it seemed kind of funny because they were like, yeah, I used to just hold my breath and pass out. My parents couldn't do anything to me. I'm like, that's hilarious. Um, but anyway, try to hold your breath. Do a little competition. See how long you can hold your breath. See if you can beat me. I can get close to two minutes. Um, but at some point, you're going to take a breath. You're going to say, oh, I have to breathe. So too, your glorified body in heaven is going to be designed to only ever respond in the ways in which Christ has always anticipated you to reflect God's glory. All right. That's just going to be part of the restoration, fully redeemed mankind in heaven. You will um, live naturally to please God and to reflect his goodness uh, to both God and uh, your neighbor in heaven. So man's original capacity um, Augustine says man's original capacities included both the power not to sin and the power to sin. In Adam's original sin, man lost the ability to uh, ability not to sin and retained the ability to sin because we are broken and fallen creatures is what the scriptures say, which he continues to exercise. In the fulfillment of grace, man will have the ability to sin, uh, to sin taken away and receive the highest of all the power not to be able to to sin, which is going to be so great. And I think all of us deep down inside, especially how I heard you guys describe the world in which you created, we all long for that. We all have a desire to get back to the garden. So we have to ask the question, are we going to be in Adam or in Christ moving forward as Christ followers? In order to accomplish this, namely that God has promised to save all those who are justified and reconciled through Christ, there exists a life-giving union between Christ and his own that is similar to, but not more, but more powerful than the death-producing union between Adam and all his own. So there's something way more life-giving, way more powerful um, in, in what Christ has to offer than what Adam has to offer, what we're naturally born into. We're talking about this. Um, just this morning in our, one of our Zoom youth group meetings. And it was sweet. We read through Ephesians chapter four. We saw what life looks like in Christ. We saw, Paul reminded us what life doesn't look like in Christ. We can stray from that, but how we're supposed to retain that at the end of chapter four. We're supposed to be unified with Christ ultimately and not our, not our old ways. So at, sin still has an active role in our life though. And this is what I need to caution you about. Call attributes to sin a very active role. Notice the language here in the passages. And these passages, pardon me, come from the book of Romans. I didn't quote that, but it comes from the book of Romans. So it sin can reign. That is very active. Can Sin can be obeyed. Pay, you can pay wages to sin. Um, sin seizes opportunity. Sin deceives and kills. In a word, he personifies sin, picturing it as a power that holds sway in the world outside Christ, bringing disaster and death on all humanity. 
sin is still very much active in our world today and can rip us off and can pull us down, can wipe us out. And we have to be on guard against that, you guys. We have, if, if sin has an active role in our life, we have to have an active response to it. And we don't have to ever spend our days or our time fighting against sin. We just say, look what Christ did for my sin on the cross. He's the one who has taken care of it. I don't fight for this thing called salvation. I fight from it. And Christ is the one who is ruler and king in that conversation. He is victor and he has conquered sin and death. He is the one who has taken the active role on my behalf. So be careful of that in your days. I don't have time to go into Satan's strategy because I want to I want to wrap things up here. But one of the um, I I'll, I'll quickly get through this. Um, I want to talk a little bit more at length, but I, I like I said I don't have time for that. So Satan's strategy has always been the same. He simply says, "Has God said?" That was what he said in Genesis three to um, Eve. Did God really say you should eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Those are his very first words in the scripture are questioning the word of God. Don't miss that because people today echo Satan's critique by questioning the word of God. He hasn't changed his method of operation since day one. Now, if I were to tell you, wouldn't it be beneficial if you knew every single play the opposing soccer team was going to make or every single play the opposing volleyball team was going to make or every single play the opposing basketball team was going to make? If you knew in advance, which obviously that's only an analogy you shouldn't, you should be a, a fair sportsman, uh, a sports player and all of that. But if you knew in advance, it'd probably give you an upper hand. Here's the thing. We have Satan's strategy book. He always questions God's word. We know what he's going to do. He's going to put that in our mind. He's going to put that in our heart. And how we choose to live out on that dictates whether we're going to listen to Satan's um, strategy or God's for uh, uh, God's will for us in our life. Okay, so he questioned that, and and ultimately we see this also in First John chapter two, uh, verse sixteen. That that's what he did in the in the garden, and he still does it today in our life. He goes after, you know. Um, the lust of the flesh, as John says in 2.16, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Satan's going to try to bog us down with all of that. And we have to be on guard and take an active role, um, to put it in Paul's language, to really put on the full armor of God and recognize that Satan is still taking an active role. Sin is still taking an active role in our life. And we get to plead the blood of Jesus, not fight the battle in and of ourselves. Don't do that. You'll never win. But if you situate yourself in the gospel message that Jesus loves you and died for you, then you're going to have the best active response towards sin possible. Okay. That brings me to the end of the presentation. You guys, again, go ahead and make sure you are um, taking good notes on this material. There's going to be a place for you to turn that in on Google Classroom. Have an awesome weekend. We'll see you guys next time. God bless you.